Welcome live to our segment right here from CHF Christ is the Head Fellowship. Again, you know, our pilot verse for this fellowship is that no man can lay any other foundation than that which is laid already, who is Jesus Christ. And so we didn't fit that this fellowship is called that Christ is the head. And we are the parts of his body. And we do our bit right now here today again with you. This topic that, you know, we have prepared and I have prepared and Holy Spirit conveyed. And now we are going to share with you. We thank God for this topic. And this is as simplest as it can be about the five most important quotes or truths about what Jesus had uh, said about our lives. And that this will help you focus right here at this time because it is the most important thing that we could actually do when it comes or relate with when it comes to the many facets of the complexity of our being, our being human, placed here by God. And why did God show us and we carry his truths in our lives? Amen. Very simple, and I hope you will probably uh, memorize all these very important scriptures. And for those of you who want to have a copy, you may just go to our website or even text us on FB, our page, Christ is the Head Fellowship. And we will gladly help you out to have the, the PDF. And we're just going to ask you to bless and also to pray with us. Amen. So God bless you for today. And here is our topic. Right. It is now on your screen. And our pilot verse is found in Luke 19. Verse 10, right? This is what was said about Jesus. And he quoted this himself. For the son of man, that's him in human form, but also son of God sent by the father, came to seek and to save those who are lost. You see, the main purpose of how Jesus came is because he seeks those of all who are lost. You see, every one of us, when he came, he saw that most of us are really lost. And it came about ever since the time when our forefathers fell from the Garden of Eden. Every one from that sin has fallen into this state of being lost. God keeps on doing his bit to reach out and seek the lost. And yet they cannot complete the many things that God has set up even to the first chosen nation or first chosen people, the Israelites. You know, that's why God in the Genesis 3 account a prophetic came through the woman, though he has been cursed with what has been said to her, that she will bear a child or birth children. And that it said about the seed who will come through her and that seed will crush the head of the serpent who deceived her. And so the prophecy has been fulfilled in the age of 2000 AD or in 2000 where Jesus Christ came in 33 and a half years right here on planet earth and that it was conceived a virgin birth by the Holy Spirit's account and through the Holy Spirit the birth of the Savior Jesus Christ and so he grew up in favor with God and man, 
was taught by God in the synagogue. And then at the age of 30, he began to preach and teach about our lives. And so here are these quotes and the most important truths about our lives that he has given to all of us as people of God and those who believed in his name. Because he came for you, because all of us are lost, including myself. And so the Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and to save those who are lost. And to be saved is to be found in Christ and in obeying to Christ. All right? So this is all about what he has taught. We have only got five important quotes of Jesus that we need to remember. And most of all, I pray that we'll have to memorize it because this is what you need in life for the rest of your lives. These are the most important, crucial, uh, you know, uh, quotes and truths of Jesus for all of us as people of God. Okay, so this is about, let me just grab it, about our earthly lives here where we are placed here. Jesus was also placed here, became son of man, okay, in human flesh and blood. And these are what he taught in, during his ministry. The, the five most important truths or quotes of Jesus to remember and live by. Number one, he talks about who is our life's mentor. Okay, therefore, it is only him, Jesus Christ. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Came for you and for us. Okay, number two, what is our life's quest? Where are we going to gear all the talents, the gifts, of the things that God has given us and what mindset should we have while doing all those things that God has entrusted, stewarded us. The third is our life's influence. We're our call of being lights because we are children of the light who is Christ, that's him, and how we should emanate that light we have in him. The fourth is life's abundance. God is not wanting for all of us to live in the meager things. In fact, he is the one who has shown us what it is to tap into God's miracles himself. The things that only God can give. The things that only God, God can give those unsearchable things. Hidden in Christ, hidden in the heavenlies, that only God could give to you and I. And what are those three keys of abundance? And that we should get those keys so that we can all live by it and never forget that those keys are very important to live by in our lives. If we want what Jesus said about, I will give you life and life abundant, or in other version is, I will give you life and enrich that life. Amen. So God is not calling us to be in poverty or impoverished, more so to be poor in our souls. God wants us to be like him in favor with God and men and have the joy of the spirit living in our lives for the rest of our lives to be filled with his joy and presence in our lives. And the fifth and the last portion is we should never forget life's main focus, which is all about love. And that Jesus talks about that in just one commandment as two, two in one, which is to love God and love others. Amen. So let's go and then digest. And even now, let's just, you know, himay himayin natin how to really go about with all of these important truths what Jesus has left for all of us to live by. Amen? So number one, that life's mentor is Jesus Christ. And 
The pilot verse here is found in John 14, 6. And it says, Jesus answered, all right, there's no other life mentor that you should actually focus and learn from. Okay, who is Jesus Christ? He said this about himself to the disciples so that they will not be distracted. Okay, and he says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You know, the, the disciples there were so fortunate that they've already seen and heard what it is to have Jesus as being the way, the truth, and the life. And that Jesus said, if you have seen me and know me, you've already seen the Father himself. So there's no other way that Jesus is pointing out about eternal life except to look to him that goes straight and in alignment to the Father God. Amen. So these are the pointers on your left, which talks about Jesus as your life's mentor. We thank God for all those that we have online nowadays that we can learn from the wisdom, but more so already Jesus has pointed out the kingdom teachings, most especially in the parables of Jesus. So number one is he is the only way to the father. You see, many people are having so many ways to get to heaven. Did you know that it has been recorded 10,000 spiritual religions or denominations in the world that people are represented to be part of? But Jesus only pointed out only one way. It is true himself. There's no other substitute point to needed to reach and approach the Father, but through Him. Number three is no man, no created images or idols to call or pray to, to get the attention of the Father. Jesus explained that in connection also to the book of the Old Testament in Exodus and Deuteronomy about the Ten Commandments that it, po it pointed out what it is to love God and that all the other substitutes should not be in substitution of your attention, focus, and love, but only God himself who dwells in heaven. Number four, if we know him, Jesus, we know the Father as well. You see, if you know the teachings of Jesus, the attributes of Jesus, it is also the same as who Jesus is. They are never different from being God as one, three in one. But their nature, if you know Jesus in the New Testament and his ways and his teachings, that is also who the Father spoke about, about himself. And so that is what we call alignment. And the next one is if we follow Jesus, his words and his teachings, we follow also the Father. Amen. So Jesus and the Father has only the one way, the truth and life for our eternal life and living. So it all starts here right now as Jesus has demonstrated that in his life about how we live our lives like him in flesh and blood and that we, our life's mentor should only be centered on the gift that the Father sent for all of us, who is Jesus Christ himself. Let us look at some more truths about this uh, pilot verse that our life's mentor is Jesus. All right, John 10, 29, 30. Jesus said this, My Father, who has given them to me, you know, the disciples, because he was refuting this to the Pharisees, is greater than all. That's what he said to them. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then in verse 30, he said this about himself. 
I and the Father are one. See, when you follow Christ and you are with Christ, you and I are also with the Father and are commanded to also live by the principles of Jesus so that we too are actually obeying the Father. The next one in Philippians 2, 9 to 11 about who Jesus is and that is the only way that we need to know now in our earthly life is this word for God also had a highly exalted him and given him a name which is about every name. See, the name Jesus Christ is above any other name, name on planet earth and heaven. He is the supreme name above all. And that is what it said about him when he fulfilled the plan of the Father and execute that being the savior of the world. And that at the name of Jesus, watch this, that is really why you need to be mentored by Jesus through the spirit is because in that name, Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See those things? It is really aligned with the will of the Father and the nature of the Father. When Jesus executed everything about the Father's plan and will in his life, then he was given the same uh, uh, exaltation of the name and that the name of the Father is equal to the same name of Jesus, which is highly above all as being God. And that all of us needs to understand that only in the power of the name of Christ that we can live by and have all these things that Jesus has for his people and for his children. Amen. So let's move on to the next number two, which is the next important thing, truth about our life is what is our life's quest? All right. Uh, and our pilot verse is found in Matthew 6.32. Most of us really memorize this, but somehow we don't even understand about that kingdom. And it says here, in our earthly life or our, in our jobs, career, marriage, family life, success should be our number one quest. It must be his kingdom we seek after first and daily. Whatever we are entangled or whatever we are connected in our roles and responsibilities and even in our status and position, we are have to center on having the kingdom to be sought first and having it daily incorporated. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So the kingdom of God is always about the right godly way of living. So it's connected to that. So when you seek the kingdom, it connotates the nature of God himself. Never against it. All right. And all these things about God things, God prospering and blessing will be added to us. The all things there it talks about in the previous verses is about what we all need in life and godliness. If you're going to have a look of that, that God will add. But the more so, this is the most important thing about our life's passion and quest is to seek his kingdom, and the right way of living. We are never meant to have something that we mix evil and good and good with evil. We can never have the defilement of good plus evil together. There is no yin-yang with God. There's only you go to the good of God and the godly living, or you go to the enemy, which is the cursed living. So God is talking about us living in his righteousness, not your own righteousness, because somehow you are being, being misled by people to just compromise your beliefs and your conditions and your convictions. We have to be careful that we only seek 
his kingdom and his righteousness to that kingdom. It's like when you are in a nation or become a citizen, in a citizen of Australia or Philippines, you abide by the rules of that citizenship. And so God is telling us that our life's quest, if you are born again, we seek his kingdom as well as we are in alignment to the rules of the citizenship of that kingdom living. Amen. So we connect our day-to-day -day living with kingdom mindset and principles of his righteousness, the right way of godly living. And many of those are in the book of Proverbs, the wisdom that is called the wisdom book of God. The next one is we align our agendas and priorities within God already designed mandates and designated order. You know what it means here is that God has already set something about, for instance, marriage. Okay, another one about gender identity. God already has set all these things before it even approached the New Testament age of grace. We can never use God's grace to actually merge it to condoning our principles and convictions because God has already set a mandate for all of those things that we need to live by. If we are going to mix evil with good, then we are deceived and we are in error as most of the apostles have actually confronted many churches before in the New Testament books, right? Amen. So the next one after that, it is the point where the roles or duties where you are at, we have on earth today, we seek how the kingdom of God is reflected through it and should glorify him always. There's no other thing that we should connect and think about, but only to leave our quests to glorify only the Lord. Amen. Apostle Paul mandated in that uh, one of the churches and he said, whether whatever we say or do, do it all for the glory of God. And this is our life's quest. We only seek his kingdom and his righteousness and that whatever role, career may, you may have been, or status or position, your priorities and your agendas should have only one mindset. Will it glorify God? Will it give him pleasure or not? It is only you day to day could only answer that and put your will in execution to where you are going to decide to please God or not. So you don't have to go to many avenues of many additional added things to your life that is not in the premises of your life's quest in Christ. Because God, Jesus, has a very simple things and truths that we all must live by. And our quest here on earth is this. We seek his kingdom. Let us look at some of the verses uh, about it. Uh, life's quest his kingdom and his righteousness. And so Matthew 6, 31 to 30, this is what he said, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? A lot of us are thinking nowadays, of course we need to eat, right? But we are consumed by it. And that you, you want to get more of, you know, the food that you want to eat. So you work hard more to feed, okay? And not the, the, the content of, of, of uh, just being fed by God, right? And then he said, what shall we drink? Right? Most of us are not content with just having water. We have, you know, consumed other drinks, which is somehow the Lord knows that it is not needed for us and that we are consumed at it. And where we do, shall we be clothed? Some of us are not content with just the simple clothes that we were given, we can buy, we can still go to those you know, all this branded and we just, you know, sell ourselves, you know, just one dress of a branded uh, uh, dress, right? The quest, okay? 
somehow can actually feed a community, a poor community, that God will actually help us to facilitate his kingdom and bring the gospel. All right. For your heavenly father, know it that you have need of all these things and he is able to provide. But it says a but. All right. So all of those things the father knows. But this is our life with the but. Seek it first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of those things prior, okay, the food, the drink, and the clothes, it will be added to you. It will be given to you without paying or looking, right? Romans 14, 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not all of those ple fleshly pleasures. It's never about that kingdom of God. What matters to God are this, but again, of righteousness, okay? Peace, it connects, right? The same message of Apostle Paul, called to the Gentiles, okay? Jesus said this to the Israelites, the Jews, and Apostle Paul was called to the non-Jews. And that refers to us now in this time and age of grace. So righteousness Peace. Will it give peace to you? Did, you know, you feel not convicted by God when you do it. You've got the God peace in you. And every plans and every byways and process, it is all godly ways and means. And joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, we grieve somehow the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit in joy with you as you are doing that thing? that you are doing, seeking God or that quest of yours in your life? Is he being given pleasure and joy of heart? You will actually feel it when the Holy Spirit is actually approving that gesture of yours, your quest of yours, it's which is in alignment to his will. You know, some people have found out that when they've actually abandoned everything about their fleshly, nature and come in agreement with God. Somehow quickly the Lord the next day releases the perfect blessing that is just awaiting for them for a long time to be given because finally they get to know their life's quest before God. See, that's how God wants us to understand about our life here on earth. That we are not just Living it because we have, you know, we're just going to heaven and we just accept Christ. There is this thing that we need to follow how Jesus lived that life. And so his quest is only sought to please the kingdom of the Father and his righteousness displayed through his life. Amen. And so let's move on to the third one about the truth, the third truth of Jesus, which is. The life's influence, our life's influence is becoming lights to this world. Matthew 5, 16, all right? It says there, I'm so sorry, in the same way, in the same way, let your light shine in front of people. Then they will see the good that you do and praise your Father in heaven. You see, our living every day is being watched. They need to see the good of the Father through us, right? And we carry that light that comes from Jesus. And again, that will give praise straight to the Father. So the points here are our consecrated life, that separate life set apart for God, the Ecclesia Church of God, the separate people of God, must serve as lights for this darkened world. Remember how Jesus, actually, when you become born again, you will transfer, the Apostle Paul said that in one of his epistles or verses that we have, are reading, that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. All right? So the next one is this. We have been chosen by God to be bearers of light to bring them 
to him. We are carrying Jesus, the light of the world. So when we have Jesus being the light of the world, where he said that, quoted that in John, and he said, I am the light of the world, and you accept him as your personal Savior and Lord. And he is that light now in you, the light of the world. Now through our lives, we carry that life. life. We light, we are bearers of that life. And people see that through our good deeds that we do. Look at the verse. See the good that you do to them or that they see in you and through you. See, somehow we are not recognizing this and that what we project to others is not really good. Sometimes we even cause others to stumble and somehow we don't even reach out to be reconciled now all of these things are but nature of a god-given life in christ the new born again kind of life that we are set as lights to the world as jesus is the light of the world so we do it actions that reflect jesus light in us and so also through us they will praise our god the father and jesus christ and not hate him or even know him did you know that many people are stumbled by how the christians behave in their sphere of influence somehow they are good at bearing that light when it comes to this kind of uh, life's influence but somehow it's being blinded and short-sighted because of the actions that we are not aware of and we're not willing to change so that they can see the light you see we need to actually learn many things about jesus so that the influence that we carry is all about him okay because they can only see the light through us Somehow we are the epistles as that we are read. Apostle Paul said that. There's no other light that they see except that our lives are epistles, lights that they can read through that we bury Jesus. So if we have messed it up, right now we ask for forgiveness. We actually repent and let this be something that we ask God, Lord, I want you to begin in my life the influence that you are the light in me and that light I will show forth day to day in my life so that you will be seen by the people that is darkened by the world and by Satan. You see, the Bible also speaks about that a veil has covered a lot of people in the world. They haven't seen the light and how we should pray that the, that veil that covers them will be taken of them and that by our lives and our demonstration of our lives, they will see Jesus in us. Somehow we are also short-sighted. And somehow we have to ask God, the Holy Spirit, Lord, teach me. Lord, show me where have I come short of the glory of God, the light of Jesus in me. Every day we have to ask that. And every day we have to repent, renounce of the things that has made us have a projection of darkness. And that through our mouths, we say that we are God's children. There should be no uh, misinterpretation when it comes for us how to influence the world and how we lived by that through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why the Holy Spirit is in charge of bringing us that fruit. But in bringing those fruit, we have to be costing our lives of obedience. What it will cost us, we have to obey. If God says you have to do this to be able to get to this fruit of self-control, then do what was God telling you with those steps to gain that fruit. And this is how you gain the glory of God each day from glory to glory. You shine as being lights to the world. Your influence will increase and increase just as much as Jesus has had that influence in his life, the world in his life. And up to now, look at what he has influenced all of us. 
is not he is not alive present with us in the physical and yet by the spirit of god and by his teachings and the example of those who followed him and even followed him right now in our time today they have also have emanated projected the influence as lights to this world amen so we have a duty of care that we are we can never get away that when we are born again, we have that influence right here in our lives. We cannot just leave that to those who have studied theology and all those who have certificates, those bachelor's degree being theologians or apologists. We are compelled by God himself, all of us, as disciples of Christ, to have this influence embedded and be concreted and made assured and that we will by might have to be carers and good carers of bearers of the light of Christ in us. Amen. So that the people of the world will see light. They will see that even the enemy himself, they know if you are carrying that light and how much light you are carrying. In fact, Jesus emphasized that light with the parable of the wise virgins that they need to be lit until he comes and that the oil of the fire of the spirit is still is in us and that we are keeping on burning and ablaze in that lamp of life we carry for christ our bridegroom amen so we influence them through actions of faith hope and love these are the three greatest things that the apostle have left the Corinthians, who is a church which is so troubled with a lot because they are uh, surrounded by the many mixtures. It's somewhat like us today. We've got so many things, you know, media that has compacted our time, ruined our time focus, and that we are not assured of something that we should become. Okay, and so the three things about us influencing people are this. What has come about with your faith right now? What hope do you carry? Is it emanating the hope of Christ in you? It the, is the love spreading abroad through you. And this is what it is about the life being a light to the world. So we have this duty and mandate once you are chosen by God. So you were not just, you know, uh, chosen by God to be his child. A child carries duties before the father. And in fact, one of the parables that Jesus has shared is about the two sons. The one son has actually given a mandate to go, but he did not go. And the other ones who said, uh, who disobeys, that he will not then obey. And Jesus commended the one who actually disobeys and yet towards the end of his life obeyed him. And so that is it about us being chosen by God, by Jesus to be his son and daughter, and that your life should not be on any other thing of influence of the world, but just to become the lights for Jesus. Amen. Amen. So that Jesus Christ will also be glorified. And look at this. Praise your Father in heaven. Amen. So the third one is about, these are all the scriptures also as well. Matthew 5, 14, 16. This is what it says about us chosen by God. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, that's what Jesus' analogy of the two examples prior to this truth. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds or works and glorify your Father in heaven. So your life is not meant to be hidden. Your life is meant to be seen and known. Your identity, who you are as a daughter and as a son of God. This is something that you must know and 
really know about why God chose you. Because now you are the light of the world. Amen. And John 8, 12 says this. Jesus about himself. I am the light of the world. And next to that, for whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, the reason why we are not supposed to be hiding when we are born again or become has become the sons and daughters is because of this light that we carry. We have the Jesus as the light of the world. And as we follow him, we carry that light of light, life that others will just follow and see the secrets to have that light of light that they should not be blinded or darkened, no longer darkened by Satan, but through our lives and deeds, they will know the path to Jesus and to that light of life. The only path that even though they die, they will see and will be led to that eternal life of glory, who is Christ himself. Amen. So right here, Jesus is the light of the world. Mind that. He is the light of the world. You are going to show for Jesus here on planet earth. Because in heaven, there's no point of Jesus being the light of the world. Because he is the light of heaven already. Amen. So here is what Jesus says that whoever follows me carries the light of life. Are you challenged? The what is your influence right now? As this is about the truth about your influence. Just learn about this truth about your life. You carry that life. That life was given to you by Jesus. That body, that those talents, those you know features. You are wonderfully and fearfully made by God. And you have an influence of your life, which is to be bearers of light. Light, Amen. So the next one is about life's abundance. What is this? This is the fourth, which is all about what are those three kingdom key keys? Because God doesn't want us to be impoverished both as in soul as well as in the spirit. The soul and the spirit should be aligned itself as one, enriched in God. Amen? And what are those kingdom gifts? Let's look in Matthew 7, 7 to 8. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives he who seeks finds and to him who knocks the door will be opened you see jesus promise here in his in the present progressive tense what it means is it wasn't just promise in the long time ago while he was alive it is ongoing promise for all those who believe in his precious name and this is his challenge that in that name those who ask will be given to seek. They will knock. It will be, the doors will be open. They will seek and they will find. Now let's have a look of those truths about these three kingdom keys. And most of all, the truths about all of this that Jesus himself has have, uh, shown us what are these keys for. Okay, Jesus has set in the truth these three keys to our abundance. Practicing the simple truths in prayer, in faith, in faith, always in faith. You see, the asking, the seeking, and the knocking should only be in the character and nature of faith. Amen? So when we ask, it is always given. Because always, this is what it sees, why it's given. Because always we first check our motives and our intents. And Apostle James says that about asking amiss. What does it say? We'll go through and look through those verses. The seeking, which is you will find, it says here the seeking needs to be in alignment to his sovereign will and timing. Because we seek his approval first, 
and his word of promise, then we wait and then we will find it. Amen. So the sovereign will of God, we cannot, you know, push God or demand God. He's got his perfect will and timing and he knows what you're seeking. Uh, you know, things are in alignment to his word. And most of all, to his perfect timing and will. And about the knocking and the door will be opened. It says some doors, some doors are really locked. That's why you need to knock. Okay. This is when we persist. If the door is still locked in our petition and let the Lord try us and prove us in our character. If we are ready and receive such a huge deserving blessing, we knock on God's doors. When it opens, it's like to overflowing. What is one of the best example of this is in the book and the life of Job or Job, right? In the life of Job, he thought that in his righteousness, why did God let them, you know, have all the mishaps, those bad experiences? While he is righteous, God himself even says the righteous Job. But then at the end, God has been trying him to knock on the doors of God himself, not just see his doors to God, but to knock on the doors of the heart of God to align more in depth and intimacy with God. And finally, he just saw that this righteousness does not amount to God's righteousness because God, as his righteousness, is not even equal to God's righteousness. And the only thing that he has to do is to submit to God whatever plan he needs to go through. And before you knew it, he found the secret and then he humbled himself. And so he'd never get to knock anymore and try to prove himself to his friends or to even God, because he has the reasons in Job 30, how he actually, you know, paraded uh, him, his righteousness to God, his goodness to God. And yet God did not even listen. In fact, he was rebuked. But then God, towards the end, when he submitted in humbleness and with the purity of his heart and just succumbed to God's will, then God really opened those doors. And lo and behold, the exchange of what was lost was tremendous. And in Job 31, you will find the double many thousands of replacements that he has lost because he finally found out that how to knock on the door of God that was closed and that God has his own thing in mind when to open it and how to open it. Amen. So that is how we get to the keys of the abundance and all these keys are character building i tell you this you know all these things about seeking about uh you know asking and about knocking god is really on the character building of his nature the jesus nature in us to become in the full image of christ himself it is not to the complacent this character building it is not to the complainer it is not to the grumbler, the lazy, the quitters, the doubters, that abundance from the kingdom is possible. It's only to the faith heroes. Are you one of his faith heroes that when God told you to do something, to get to your designated mandate and blessings for you and your generations to come to your children and children's children, are you asking and seeking and knocking in accordance to God's will and purpose. And this is only how you get to that desired position, the mandate, designated mandate and call of God, why God has chosen you and why God wants you to represent him right here on the earth and that people through you will get to be known, saved and 
Jesus and God will be known to you and your influence. Amen. Because in the life of Job, all of his children, after he understood everything about God's righteousness and God's sovereign will, and that he needs to trust God in all, all of everything in his life, then finally he has received the abundance of God. Okay, our desires too, they're all God desires. You see, when God gives you desires, they're all God desires. God will not limit anything for you. He is a God of expansion. He is a God of extension. He is a God of influence. And so we must actually get in connection with God. He is just desiring our alignment and true relationship. You know what? When God wants us to seek his abundance, he wants us to understand that we have to be in alignment to his true nature and that we will understand that there is not supposed to be this just, you know, uh, this, th this relationship that is just, you know, puppy love or this thing that is just facade surface love, this shallow uh, love. God wants us to have the agape love as well towards him and towards others. Because this is only when we understand that our lives are set and actually learning from the life of Jesus himself as being man, as being the son of God as well. So this is how we get. And let's look at the verses that is in connection to all this asking and all this uh you know seeking and knocking okay so let's have a look the life's abundance in three ways or means and these are the scriptures right there on your top and it says here in james 4 2 and 3 it says ye lost and have not ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain ye fight and war Yet you have not, because you ask not. So that's that's one way to ask. You have to ask first. You ask and receive not, and this is the reason why. Because you ask amiss. What is that amiss? We'll talk about that. That you may consume it upon your loss. Let us move on to a different version and translation. And when you do ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives that you may squander it on your pleasures. You see, somehow we are praying to God about something in abundance. And God is never giving that because already God looked and has searched your very motives. He has dug deep into the motives and your plans. He has already seen where is it connected? Is it connected with your lust? Or is it connected with the kingdom principles of generosity and building his kingdom and purposes? See, somehow God is not giving you that abundance because it's not going to reflect his glory through you. It is actually only for your own self-famousness and also for your self-pride and conceit. God will never answer those things that is concerning just you in the flesh. God's concern is you walking in the premises of his kingdom and in the spirit so that all of the things that you have in abundance, in seeking and asking, you never miss it. That's asking a miss because your main motive is to build his kingdom and not to squander it. As one example is who? is the prodigal son when he's got his inheritance from the father he goes out and squanders it for himself with all the worldly things around him and then finally at the end of his nothingness then he actually realized that he has squandered the things that god the father gave him you see god will never actually uh you know be in the way for your will where you're going to use the abundance. But God, nevertheless, somehow, if you consistently, you know, pressure him and he will give you that permissive will, but that permissive will is not the perfect will, will actually hurt you 
and be a danger to you, you'll never know. Okay? So let's move on. Let's see. But from there, you will seek the Lord, your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. See, God wants us to actually, you know, check our hearts to seek him. Lord, is this will please you. And then also in Revelation 3, 7, 8, it says, what he opens is about the doors. No one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds, all right? God knows all of our deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. When everything is in place and God pleasurable and God sees that is approved in his eyes, in his pleasure, in his joy and not grieving the Holy Spirit, then that door is open for you and no one can shut it. I know that you have little strength. This is what Jesus said. Somehow we don't have enough strength to do it. But you see, you have kept God's word and you have not denied his name. This is all about the doors. The doors that we knock. Sometimes the doors are closed because it's not for us. The doors are open that no one can shut because it's in alignment again to his fellowship and his relationship. Amen. So when we seek again, don't forget, it is all about all of our nature set bare before the eyes of him who beholds. Amen? Wala tayong tinatago agenda. Okay? Wala tayo sa subconscious na, yeah, I have this in mind, and this is a good plan, but that plan is evil. It's not in alignment with the, with the word and the premises of the kingdom. That will not come about. And if you push, you'll get not the perfect result that is glorifying God and you bearing that light. Amen? So, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. You know that there are things hidden that in our day-to-day -day living, God reserves that for you according to his timing and purpose. But you need to continue to call. It's about persistence. It is about not quitting. It is about call to him with that nature of truth. And sincerity of love. And then one day you will be blown away with something that you have never searched. And yet God gives it to you in abundance. Amen. And it says here, delight yourself in the Lord. That means your lifestyle is God is having a delight from day to day. And watch this. The desires that you have is in alignment with him. And so he says is he will give you the desires. Of your heart somehow what jesus promised and all these things will be added to you you don't need to work for it because he himself can provide for it in fact he even demonstrated that even the sparrows doesn't have to work for their feeding every day god provided for it daily amen and so the same and he said this you are more than sparrows did you see how Jesus actually says that about us? That we are more, you know, important than the birds in the air. That God sees our needs and he provides for it. In fact, we don't have to work hard for it. Okay, where we all our energies and strength are spent, we got sick because we are pushing it in our own mindset, our own abilities, our own intellectualism. Our geniusism, all right? Our, you know, our, uh, you know, accolades of being honors and valedictorians. That's not what God says about this. Because the Father is ready to bless you in abundance. Amen. And the last but not the least is our life's main focus. So there's only one Jesus command. And that is found in Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. Let us look at this one. And Jesus replied to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul 
and with all your mind. Wow, that is talking about the whole being of all of us, our complexity as being human, the soul side of it, right? With the mind, will, and emotions, and also the spirit, amen? This is the first and the greatest commandment. And then the second is like it. First and second, watch this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. As you give importance to in your life, you give importance the same to those around you. And then it says here, the whole law and the writings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. Did you see that Jesus concise the whole history from the Old Testament to the New Testament and beyond? What should be our main focus in life? And he taught us this one simple thing about these two commandments, the main focus of our lives, that first, the greatest commandment is to put Jesus, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, to love them as one God who created us, spend our time loving them with all our hearts, mind, and soul, and then through our lives, execute that life that we have in relationship with him to love our neighbors from where we are right now. Because in heaven, there's no more influence, no more focus there. Our one focus there is to face Jesus. Our focus here on earth is the same as what Jesus' focus is, to please God, to love God with all his heart, and then love the people around him. And by loving people is he executed one mission, destroy the works of the devil. He has been an instrument of God the Father to be like the Father, to bring life and light to the people around him. And so this is what it is about Jesus' focus and should be our focus and what Jesus commands us to have this life settled and fixed on this two commandments as one. Amen. So the Old Testament, God's people live by the law. And that's what's emphasized here, the whole law, the Old Testament law. It was given to first and foremost to Moses. The Ten Commandments was actually given to the Israelites. They were the first chosen people that emerged from history, ancient history past. Okay. So Moses was given that command the Ten Commandments was given to them, but they broke it. And then, plus many other laws as being chosen, laws by being chosen by God to maintain connection to Him and have His blessings low. You see, ang hirap. It's so hard to be in the Old Testament. You can find that actually in the books of Deuteronomy, Exodus, and Leviticus. You obey blessings and obey blessings and not you will be cursed so if you obey your blessings if you don't obey you're cursed and the torah books describes it all it's in the book of again deuteronomy uh, exodus the book of torah matthew Ma uh, moses genesis exodus uh, leviticus numbers and deuteronomy find it listen to it you know you, sometimes somehow you don't just you know check on the new testament although you are in the new testament grace and Jesus wants us to focus on being, you know, in the age of grace right now. But somehow connect your life over there and see how hard it is for them to live. And that it was really has cost them to whether they would go to heaven and have God's blessings or be cursed and straight to hell. Very hard. And Jesus concised it on the, only to those things. And Jesus fulfilled it in this command. After Moses all need to listen to God's chosen messengers. The next after Moses was the era of the prophets, and they're called messengers of God. So there are major and minor prophets in the Old Testament, like as in the book of, you know, Habakkuk, Nahum, Micah, Malachi. All this are just but books. And says, again, same outcome of blessings 
or even curse. So merong outcome ang blessing before and even the curse, right? That was in the time of the prophets after the book of the laws. But Jesus came in the Old New Testament. This is now the different story with him. Now we are living in the age of grace and both laws and prophets era were made simple but same outcomes. The blessing or the curse. So in the New Testament era, the, all of the descriptions of the details of how you connect with one sin and you know you are cursed by not doing the things required to amend and be erased in that sin. Now Jesus actually has all those teachings at hand and he made it simple, but also it entails both blessings also if we obey or disobey the curse. So the Holy Spirit's voice and leading is the key to our focus today to eternal living. His will done always in our lives, the Holy Spirit's you know, voice and leading. The Holy Spirit also was given to us being the witness on how we conduct our lives daily with God. He is with us. He is, uh, he is for us and not against us, but somehow in our day-to-day -day living, we actually, three, uh, there are three sins we do to him. We grieve him, we quench him, and we outrage him. Okay, that's in the book of the New Testament. So, another one is his life too has been the same. This is Jesus' life too. Jesus' only command. The Holy Spirit led and submit to the Father's will. He is a Holy Spirit led and he submits to the Father's will until his death. Philippians said that uh, in the Philippians book. This, the New Testament, is Jesus' command. So this is only what Jesus commands to all of us living now in the grace era. No longer bound with the laws and the prophets. We are in grace and we have the Holy Spirit sent by us, given to us as our guide, as our teacher to help us to execute the kingdom living principles and command. Amen. So this is our life's focus on these verses as follows. Jesus, one commandment for life. Now, even in Deuteronomy, it is still has been said by Jesus, quoted by Jesus in the New Testament. Here, Israel, at the time, it was only the Israel. So this was commanded, one command by God, the old command. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the same thing as what was quoted by Jesus, remember? Now, in Romans 39 to 10, it says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in the saying. Now, these are all summed up. All those commandments are about loving your neighbor. And it says, Jesus said this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, when Jesus said that, the second commandment, which is to love your neighbor, you are not wanting to even harm your neighbor. And so Jesus was emphasizing about our lives, not offending anybody if we need to love and fulfill the commandment of the law of Jesus which is all about love. You see, all these commandments above here was the commandments on how you love your neighbor. So with loving your neighbor, you are not supposed to commit adultery if you are married, okay? You will hurt your spouses. That's loving and fulfilling the law. If you love your neighbor, you will not commit murder or kill them, kill them in their emotions, kill them in their dreams, kill them in their aspirations and dreams and things that they want for life for themselves and their happiness and joy in Christ, of course. 
And then another one that you need to understand about loving your neighbor is you don't covet and you don't steal. Okay. So first thing is you do not steal. Stealing their dreams, stealing their, you know, their lives, stealing their everything that is connected about their living. You steal and steal and steal. That is not about loving your neighbor and fulfilling the law of Christ. Another one is about you shall not bear false witness. If you are always in this verge of continuously having witness falsely, which you don't even know what comes to place in from a brother against another brother, and you intermeddle or meddle in the affairs without God's revelation, then that is again not loving your name. And again, most and foremost, which again, uh, the, the, the Lord God, Jesus, actually exposed it by uh, Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you shall not covet, is that anything that our brothers have, we don't, uh, you know, like covet it at that we should have. Because Whatever we all have is was given by God. That is a lot that we have given that we need to be content. Our gifts, our calling, everything that the Holy Spirit gives as part of the body, we have to be content. And we should not even make our neighbors be mad, our neighbors to, you know, because we stole their ideas. We stole their calling. We stole and tried to rob their ministries or we try to even destroy it. God respects and the apostles respects every single one of the members of the body of Christ in the Acts, the book of Acts, their callings they respect. As Peter respected Apostle Paul, as called to the Gentiles, Apostle Paul also respected Apostle Peter, uh, is a code to the Israelites, the Jews. See, this is how God works about loving our neighbor. And we are fulfilling the law of Christ. If we are just conscious of our God-given cause, talents and gifts that we execute and what we have now in Christ and make it enriched in our focus to loving our neighbor. Amen. So these are the things that talks about this right here in Romans 13, 9 to 10 explains to us about loving our neighbor. Amen. And there's more into this Galatians 5, 14 to 15 for the entire law the Torah law, the Israelite law, is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And watch this. Again, Apostle Paul said this. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So this is a warning to the Galatian church, the people of God. And what's happening here is that there is an issue that they bite and devour each other. I'm right, I'm right, you know, and you are not right, and I'm right. So they keep on biting. Oh, they, you know, don't even listen to that. Nowadays, we use the medium of social media to attack and bully one minister after the next. And this is one of those things that Jesus talks about us, to love our neighbors. You know, Jesus even respects many ministries during his time, even if they are not of the fold of his 12 disciples that is being groomed to be his apostles, his, his uh, people to be uh, executing the first church. Okay? Jesus respects everything that has his name being used so that others will believe. You see, that name alone can protect those who believe in that name. They shall be saved. And so biting and devouring one another is never an exercise for the people of God. You see, because that is about we love our neighbor in that manner. Again, Jesus actually reminded us meticulously here on how we do it. In Matthew 25, 36 and 40, I was naked, Jesus said this, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you 
a stranger and take you or naked and clothe you. This is what he said. Oh, when did you, we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Now look at what Jesus said about the, the, the direct connection between our neighbor that have all these things that are have all these issues, sick, naked, and in prison, right? Look at this at what he says, and the king will answer, he's talking about himself, and say to them, Assuredly, make it sure, I say to you, in as much as you did it to one of the least, you clothe it, you feed them, and you give them drink, and you visited them, you actually these are the list of my brethren, my brothers, and straight away you did it to me. There is connection about how we treat others, right? You know, uh, others that is connected straight to the heart of Jesus. And these are the things that we can do right now and do with our deeds. You know, there was a quote that was said that, you know, everybody will remember, will not remember the things you give to them. But what they will remember is how you treat them. So there are things in actions that will come about that they know that you love them. And they know that you love them as your neighbor. And you give them importance as well as you give importance to yourself. You see, God hates the greedy, the, the ungenerous people. God wants us to be like him, the givers. Blessed are the givers rather than the receivers. If God blesses us, then we, in abundance, that we should look more on how these people need to be clothed, dressed, fed, drunk, drink, right? Because we are doing it for the Lord. Amen? So, Jesus actually by Jim uh, May here, I love this. Jesus is really everything we all need. It says, I love this quote, what people need is Jesus Christ, not the Christian religion. Religion is just another futile attempt to reach God by trying to be good. Jesus Christ is the life of God in us and no human can ever achieve it without him. This is a how ordinary men live extraordinary lives. You see, this kind of extra, extraordinary lives has been lived by Jesus, exemplified to the disciples, who then in the book of Acts still live the life of extraordinary lives, burying the Holy Spirit-filled life, the life of Jesus in them. Amen. Life to life abundant. Jesus is everything we all need. And Jesus made all these five important quotes about our life today. And I hope that you will not ever forget all these five truths about what is your, who is your life's mentor? Who is your, what is your life's quest? What is your life's influence? What is this your life's abundance keys? And what is your life's main focus? Amen. And here is my quote. Jesus' law of New Testament living by his grace is simple, but demands cost. What is about that is love God above all and love others. This is how we should live in this New Testament living by grace. We live in the sensitivity and in accordance to a spirit-filled, led life. Jesus has given us the spirit when we accepted him. His spirit is within us. We have the spirit of Christ in us. So therefore, that spirit of Christ only, we live as the Holy Spirit leads us. And how we should always Ask, seek, and also knock on its approval and its pleasure to give all the glory and all the honor to the only one Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, whom one day we'll all meet together and give all the crowns that is only to him.
the Lamb of God who saved the world. Amen. So this is now your cue. This is Jesus' important truths about our life here on the earth. And I hope that you are so blessed. Memorize those scriptures. Now you know now how we can maintain this life in the Lord. How Jesus lived it, we know that we can all live it together. Amen. Let us serve to be as lights in the world as Jesus Christ has become the light of the world. Amen. God bless you. This is now Sister Annie Regaliza from Christ is a Head Fellowship. And that before we go, we would love to pray and all of us together in one prayer and petition before God about how we should live this life that is be in God's life as well in Jesus' life. Amen. Father, we thank you that how you have already explained to us through your words, through you, Holy Spirit, your inspirations of truth that we should live by, not in short of it, but in the abundance of what Jesus promised in John 10, 10, life and life abundance, that we must love God with all of our hearts, mind, and soul, and love our neighbor as ourselves. Father, we thank you for Jesus. He has set all those standards of living for us so that we all will be in alignment like him to be with the perfect will and give you pleasure in our lives all throughout our days so that we will not live short of your glory, so that we will live that abundant life and joy and blessings only in the presence of where Jesus, you and the Holy Spirit will have all its fullness working and emanating in and through us. Father, we thank you for today. And we just give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise for all the fruits that will come about in the lives of your people in this unsaved world, Lord, that they may know, Lord, that this life is what you seek in all of us so that we will gain the life, life abundant in Christ alone. Amen and amen. We pray this in his most wonderful, powerful name that every knee will bow of things in heaven and earth that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Be with us all now and forevermore until we see Jesus Christ comes. Amen and amen. So God bless you today, and I hope that you will have a wonderful day from today and until our Lord Christ comes. Let us continue to spur one another in sincere love and purity of our faith before the Father, Son, and God, and Holy Spirit, and to love. Never forget to love and to let that love shine for others. Amen. Whatever the Lord asks of you, just do it. You know, God is pleased with whatever God wants for you to do for him and for his glory. Amen. This is now again, Sister Annie Regalisa signing off. And God bless you for today and until the Lord Christ comes. Amen and amen. God bless. Bye.